may not contact you in a few months. I heard that uh, he could uh, help us out with something about railroads. We know there's a great interest in this area about railroads, and especially since uh, Clinchfield's not running its regular trains in a year. And um, so this is Mr. Harding, and I'll let him take it from here. Thank you. Touch on the history of uh, the Litchfield, and I'll kind of light up their own history. Um, I want to spend more time on the post World War II history, I think it connects a lot more closely to people today. Uh, still have people living who were involved in the railroad road on it during that period of time. Secret, uh, right? The parents and grandparents, a little family stories coming out. And we'll touch upon that period of history. And so we want to give you some insight to how the railroad operate. And uh, also, we are model railroads, totally model railroads. And we use modeling as a way of preserving the history. Uh, and we brought some, a lot of our models up here. We have a layout downstairs, but it's kind of crowded, it's tight. And we put it here and put it I brought some examples up here, and I will kind of talk about some of them in terms of how the railroad operated. Um, so, let me, uh, oh, and this is the other thing towards the end, I'll, I'll touch upon some of the recent history, the mergers and stuff that went on, but the field kind of lost its identity and became kind of CSNs. So, um, Litchfield starts in Elkhorn City. Kentucky, and one of the 277 miles down through here to Spartanburg. And it connects the southeast to the upper Midwest. It crosses the Blue Ridge. Uh, most railroads go north and south parallel to the Blue Ridge. Litchfield goes right through. And that's, that's one of the now, it was built to uh, carry coal, or it was completed, I should say. It was envisioned uh, as early as 1830, 32, something like that. It was talked about building a railroad across the Blue Ridge. Uh, but construction, the rule bits and pieces here and there, uh, really didn't get going until the Often getting the coal out of the coal fields, bringing uh, the emphasis to it. Uh, so it connects the south, uh, the upper Midwest. Its highest point is 1,853 feet, and that's in the Blue Ridge Tunnel, to the south of here. Stand at the North Pole Tunnel located back to the Cedar Ridge. Uh, the steep spray. There's some different ways of specifying that. Uh, as you can say, 1.5% compensated grade. That takes into account not just the pitch, but the resistance from the train going around the curve and the factors like that. Uh, it was a railroad built rather late in the history of building railroads. Uh, a number of railroads were started in 1832, 1833. Uh, railroads made connected to the West Coast in 1846, transcontinental uh, railroads. And Winfield major construction started very late in the 1890s and was basically completed in 1950. So that was very late railroad, major railroad construction. It was built cost two hundred thousand dollars per mile. That's nineteen eleven uh, figures. And that's a very high cost of building railroad. Built to very high standards. Uh, for 80 bridges and 55 tunnels. Uh, there are 17 tunnels within 11 miles on the tunnel blues. That's from Alabas uh, going south down off 
Lynn Crowley's point, uh, no the title's uh, third born third. Um, for there, it's like 16 miles of track, and just go 1.9 miles. Really hoops around that long, except for the trail. Um, all 30 railroads can function over all four of the And this field is a very favorable grade. Um, so, this is something just for 1886, there was a Charleston, Cincinnati, and Chicago railroad shop. They built some segments, uh, but it, it uh, didn't go very far. It didn't, didn't succeed very far. 1890, the tracks that reached Charleston City from Virginia. Uh, 1893, there was a financial upheaval. Uh, there been many of those in the last couple of years. Uh, it was called the Panic of 1893. So the, uh, C C and C or the three C railroad it was called one uh, bankrupt and reorganized as the Ohio River and Charleston River, known as the OIRC. And uh, they are going again. And by of eighteen ninety nine the tracks had reached move instead of about five miles beyond up there. So this is a little further up in the ground, but it's getting pretty close to the uh, So this is 1899. 1902, Father George L. Carr, who owned a lot of uh, the coal fields in uh, western Virginia and uh, eastern Kentucky, uh, along the Baltimore Lynch River. So coal fields along the Lynch River. And he purchased uh, properties of the Ohio River of Charleston uh, and renamed it the South and West. And he did that to kind of uh, throw some of the competition off the track to what he was on. He started construction and the uh, engineering guys. Uh, people want to do build the railroads at very high standards. If you build railroads at the cheap end, you build the high end, and so on. This railroad was built at very high standards. So they started extending in 1902, but 1903 it reached the cruise line. 1905 the tracks went as far as Alabama. Alabama was sort of logistics. Miles and down off the Blue Ridge, the water construction. I think that they had seven construction camps and uh, most of them supplied from the mountain. So by 1908, they had reached Marion and first passage train uh, down there. At that point, uh, kind of
199 years by the Atlantic Coastline Railroad of the Louisville, National Railroad. Uh, this was a very profitable venture for those two railroads, and they had a lot of money off of that. So the Clinchio CC, CCO, still exists as the owner of the railroad and leasing it to the ACO now and cooperating. And they then called it the Clinchfield CRR as the operating entity. Um, and there's many other things between all this, but significantly, the last steam train and the last passenger train were 1954 and 1955. The, uh, <coughs> this time, uh, railroads were losing money on passenger service and made the automobile. Uh, the Fletchfield, in its earlier days, had two passenger trains going each way each day. By 1935, it was not that one train per day. Uh, in the early 50s, early 50s, it was not that one train. Other day, so you went from uh, you, you, you went from Tokyo to the Marion, you had to wait for the next day to come back. Uh, and then uh, in 1954, the country uh, petitioned to abandon passenger service. The state of North Carolina utilities commission stepped in and said that they would have to maintain service from. Tennessee uh, statewide to area to service the rural communities. And they did that for about a year uh, by putting a passenger car back in the freight train. Uh, and then how slow and unpredictable that might have been. And there was a regular strike in 1955 uh, that shut down most service. And it was never restored. So that was the end of the past. Um, a lot of you probably know about the village of Lost Cove. And Lost Cove was abandoned about two years after the past. Um, and so, a lot of other things in here, but by 1983, the Clinton became a big uh, CSX. Uh, now, the railroad fact. Standing Gate Railroad, you see here, the most railroad, the distance between the inside of the railroads is four foot eight and a half inches. Uh, there are narrow gauge railroads in the areas, widths of them, 30 inches and three foot of uh, 30 inches metrics of uh, water, or fence. That's the So there are two foot railroads in there. One of the reasons for narrow gauge railroads are like you. One less group to make, and so on. Uh, there were broad gauge railroads, my focus on the example of that. Um, the, uh, the while after the war of 1912, uh, British interests well, built a railroad from Montreal to Fort Maine. And the US government said, you got to make a five foot gauge so you can't run British military trains on our railroad. Where, where I wanted you to speak up just a little yeah. bit. We're all having our time okay. hearing you here in the back. Sorry. All right. So getting back to four foot eight and a half inch, there's a teacher behind them. Uh, there were different railroads built in England uh, in the 1700s. Uh, some were followed by cost or cost power. Uh, some were trams that were run in different ways. But in England, there were a lot of Roman roads. Roman to build, by laying granite down. And the Romans had a stand, I guess a military stand, and that was their chariots. The wheels were roughly as far apart. And so as chariots and all kinds of other wagons ran on the Roman roads, they would wear boots in the Both day and many would find that. Approximately 
Um, there's another story about that. If you're riding a public chariot, the distance between the three of them is the rear end of two bosses. <laughs> now, back in the early 1800s, uh, it was a, a railroad usually went to the state or government legislature to get a charter to build a railroad. And this gave it things like the power of competition and stuff like that. Uh, gave them uh, the right to solicit money through stocks and bonds and so on. So there was a lot of arguments in legislative bodies at that time about the merits of the railroad. And there was one famous uh, politician at that time, I can't recall the name now, who said, this is foolish. If you have steel or metal that is wheels on iron rails, they're just going to spin. They're just going to work. Well, there's a thing we refer to as adhesion. There's an actual adhesion between Railroad wheel and the rail. And that's what makes the rail engine going over the world. It just doesn't spin. It's not in the heat. It just gets going. Uh, the other thing on the railroad is what is the maximum grade? I mentioned that earlier. The ruling grade. The railroad ideally is flat. That's why many of them are built along water courses and other areas that are geographically flat. But as the railroad starts to have a grade to it, it puts a limit on how heavy a train can be hauled up that railroad by available locomotives. That becomes a ruling grade. That's the grade of limits the size of the train or the weight of the train. Uh, now, we're getting a little bit in the model railroad refer to the real railroad downtown as the prototype. And the ratio of that is the same as it is on the big 12 feet on that. It's all fake. But again, in the model railroad, there are a number of different gauges. And what you see here, what we know that we see is this eight row scale, half old. But the ratio is 1 to 87. So if you took one of these cross cuts, just have to put this in a refrigerator. To reach the height of a real one, you have to pile up 87 miles. So, of its length, depth, anything. The ratio is 1 to 87. Uh, Light L trains, which have been around for over 100 years, uh, have mostly been what's called full gauge, the ratio of the broken capital. And they use a ratio of 1 to 48. Uh, skull houses, as an example, many times are built to a one quarter inch scale. Uh, same, probably the same as this. Uh, SK is the one in between. They get the smaller and we work in that program we do with kids at the school and you see the photographs on the end of the table. Z scale is smaller, yeah. And that's not the limit, it's a couple of small computers. So people have taken Z scale trains and put them lay up in the suitcase. Uh, now, the other thing is G gauge. This is quite interesting because this started in Germany. It uh, became very popular in Europe, particularly in England. And people would build these all the railroads outside in the garden. And so if you could stand with God in the railroad, uh, there are a number of scales involved in it. Some people can model uh, narrow gauge, of the size of narrow gauge, standard gauge. So it's a little hard to pin down with that. But if you gauge, you will find outside the gardens, uh, there's a display of the Admiral Gardens in Nashville now, I think it's also one of the tenants of the people. And uh, there used to be a trade store in Johnson City that specialized in Anyway, um, within the uh, model railroading, there are a lot of electrical toy trains. You've got a Lionel train as a Christmas present. 
40, 50, and so on. Um, a lot of people put a little bit in the air and they show up again. Uh, and Rusty and some of the things. Um, some of those have been kind of collected and were in good shape. Um, real trades are quite good. And we have to be crazy downtown to trying to get that down to the uh, South Carolina Transportation Museum. Uh, very much at what? Uh, and that we want to go from the so that the book sign table has all kinds of things, tickets, lands, a tiny guy from China. Anything with a rigor of people. And uh, it's all kinds of junk. You may have a higher grade. So let's get back to uh, the new rigor. Can I interrupt just a minute? How do we lose the train? Did you say we lost a train? I lost it. We lost the locomotive. Lost the locomotive. On uh, in, uh, in uh, Idaho. That was the last oh. engine the Black Mountain Railroad had a tank. Uh, that engine was built in 1943, I believe it was. The U.S. Navy was a supply of trade of the people that was located in the place of Chicago. I'm getting into that a little bit because my father was the foreman of the construction of that naval supply depot. And I heard a number of people coming home today and telling me about this little diesel engine. I know the steam engine of course. It turns out that's the same engine that was in Well, I think that the well, your question, how did you lose the train? Did it roll down the bank? <laughs> no. We had, we had funds available to purchase it. And because of a question of uh, ownership, mm. it was cut up. It was cut up? Cut up the scrap. Uh -huh. And uh, then, you know, this, this is true, I think, of all kinds of people. There are a lot of things. We saved some. Uh, we had the grand ideas of bringing out the spruce line and talking to the house track of the people. Uh, well, anyways, the, the 1902, we uh, bought the uh, ORC Railroad that I mentioned earlier, and they was south of Western, and at this point, the railroad had reached from Johnson City to Boomer. And in 1908, he kind of restructured it called the Carolina Litchfield, Ohio. The Atlantic Coast Line and the Louisville Nashville leased it in 1923 and operated it as the Litchfield Railroad. So, in uh, I guess around the 60s or 70s, there were different railroad mergers and things going on. And three railroads in particular, the Chesapeake in Ohio, the Baltimore in Ohio, and the Western Maryland were joined together in what they call the Chessie system. And uh, you can see cars actually parked uh, downtown for uh, proper cars with the Chessie logo. So, um, so the Chessie system is formed. In the meantime, the Atlantic Coast Line merged with the Seaboard Airline to become the Seaboard Coast Line Railroad. This is something a lot of alphabets too, and it is. And while some of this is going on, the Boardville and Nashville and the Seaboard Coast Line and the Clinchfield and the Central of Georgia and the West Point came together a marketing scheme, they call the marketing banner. They didn't merge the railroads, but they had a cooperative marketing scheme. They call family lines. And uh, this is a, the family lines uh, sort of design. Uh, and then after that, the Louisville and Nashville and the Seaboard Coast Line did merge to become the Seaboard system. Um, 
And by the way, these three letter groups are called reporting lines. And you'll find them on railroad cars for the number. And this is how the whole railroad system keeps track of cars, where they are, uh, how much money they're making. Um, so anyways, we get down to the seaboard, and the Jesse system and the seaboard system is combined 1st of July 1986 to form CSX. Uh, Who is CSS? Right. Jesse, seaboard, yeah, merge. Okay. And that brings up a point, too. Uh, on these reporting lines, if they end in X, Y, or Z, it means it's not in railroad. It's some other kind of shipping entity, like a old road carrier or containers and stuff like that. So CSX had to add a T to be, for their reporting marks to be identified as railroad. So you see the cars in this way from downtown now. They'll be CSX T. Uh, okay, here's, here's the other thing. RIP. December 31st, 1982, CSX, actually the company before, had bought all the outstanding Carolina Division Ohio Railroad stock. Now, the CRR was not a cooperative entity, it was just an operating company. So the CCO stock bought by CSX, that was the end of Litchfield as a father and editor. So, there's a lot to operate in rail. And one of the, the key things is communication. So Litchfield's a good example. It's a single track. So how do you run trains this way and that way without having collisions? Um, there are a couple of key ingredients. And one is the rule book. And every railroad gets a rule book. And trains have a contract with it. Every employee, operating employee in the railroad has one of these. He signs for it uh, right here. And he virtually memorizes it. And he has to carry it. So, but you have to go by the book. By the book, by the rules. So you have the rules that define how trades move, which trades are priority over one of the trades, lots of, lots of details. There's also a thing called employee time team. And certain more important trains on the railroad, and that usually includes all the passenger trains, are listed in the timetable by time and location. So what time they're going to arrive at the station, or leave the station, and so on, specified. And so if you're operating a train, you have to be aware of the scheduled trains, and if they're scheduled in the timetable, they have a priority even a subset of that. When I give a railroad the trains in one direction to the priority of the trains in another direction. So it's a whole well thought out system for keeping the trains from having problems. But you can't just have time tables and have that cover a few months of cooperation of the problems. So I think it was 1845 that Moss invented the telegraph. And so the railroads quickly adopted the telegraph. And they would send messages um, called train lines um, ahead to trains to tell them what to do. You know, to clear the track on another train, um, the train is scheduled to late, all kinds of things like that. So um, the telegraph works by making clips. Now, if you, if you listen to a lot of war movies, you hear the, the Moss Code, the International Moss Code. <laughs> oh, uh, 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 uh. This 
a little different. This is an American moss coat, blend line moss coat. And operated probably that 30, 60 words a minute, something like that. And they have to be able to copy the messages in that code very accurately. In fact, they repeat them back. So the railroad has a dispatcher who is supposed to roll the trains on, keep track of them. And the issue of law is when there has to be an order maybe for trying to do something different or so on. So the dispatcher would send a lost code message called the train order uh, to stations on the line. And all the stations on the line are connected in series. So any one of them, uh, and all of them, can hear them. And the current is always flowing through this. So if, not, if any station wants to send a message, they will only switch on the key. And that's called breaking the line. The FBSCB is break, break, break. Break the line is a click. And now, if you open it, you have to go. Uh, this is another station that's right here. And you have to go. So the uh, dispatcher will send a message, and it's usually addressed to a certain station or a certain train. Each station has a sign, and the, the shock hold group. By what? B Y. B Y. Yeah. So you, you hear that? You recognize your sign. You copy the, the train order. You feed it back to the dispatcher, and then you get it to the train. So here's the train coming toward your station. You receive the call. And at the station, there would be a semaphore signal. Uh, a lot of times, there were actually letters right inside the station where the, the operator could throw it. it would, be a, uh, a signal to the train to stop to pick up an auto. So they would come to the street and stop and you would get the auto and sign for it. Or they could hoop the auto. They'd have one pole to hoop yet that they tie the auto on it, and they could stand out there and the train to try to pull the hoop up the engineer to go find the train. And then the conductor at the other end of the train press. Um, so this, this is how they had the train on this. Uh, early part of the 20th century. Uh, some of the telegraph systems I think were still in use in the 30s, maybe in the 40s, and in fact, in the 40s. So, uh, that was one thing. That practically got replaced by the, the telephone. And the railroad would have their own telephone line. Um, the the uh, dispatcher's line, the station would have a loudspeaker on the line, so he didn't hear anything that was said. It was a big time line. And the, uh, the telephones uh, usually got a headset rather than what the typical pole phone had to help up the rear. The headset was the, the, uh, the operator. This is the same guy that did the Moss Coat, he was called off. Uh, now he was a telephone, and he had the, the, the piece on and you can copy the order and the same thing. Um, so these, these were in use up until a lot of radios adopted radios. And the first radio was very big, pack sevens, but the order was 30 pounds, I guess. A few years ago, it's smaller and more practical. But at the point now, with this factor, across the and when they are conducted over in the cab of the train, there's no more codes, uh, directly by radio. So there's no more Moscow, no more telephone, so on. This is an example of the last radio of the Clinchfield Bar, that's Clinchfield number 238. Um, and so five watt walkie talkie. Uh, train crews were talking this, they were repeater stations. Uh, all over the place, so while well, it's a bigger <coughs> transmitter in the, in the locomotive itself, this is one of these. You could probably reach this back in most places on the railroad. It's a computer station right now, down here in the street's by So that's the, uh, the evolution of railroad communications. Uh, 
you can read about different train wrecks, and you'll find audit, democracy, misunderstood, um, all kinds of things like that happen. But one of the major goals of the railroads was safety. Uh, safety cost of money. Um, okay, I want to jump back to uh, long railroading a little bit. I mentioned Lionel trains. Uh, a lot of uh, the children of Dickie Boys, some gender issues, back in the 40s and 50s, into the 60s, received Lionel train sets um, as a Christmas present. And you'll see pictures of Lionel train on the Christmas tree. That one here, this was the Life magazine, 1924. And the young guy is home from or on leave or something, and he's talking to all the, the family members, his girlfriend, and so on. But the little boy isn't paying attention to that. He's got a screen down under the Christmas tree. Um, Lionel did not make trains in the wall. Uh, many industries kind of shut down, I don't know if you know. Seeing a sewing machine made rifles. Lionel um, made a lot of stuff in the Navy, but here's an example of a telegraph key that Lionel made. It's got the Lionel logo on the back, it's another one in the box. Um, this is sort of an unusual item. There are people that collect this kind of stuff, and I don't find anybody that. Because I bought this for 25 cents in the handwriting of the free market. Now it was on this table. And these, uh, these existed back in the 1920s. Tommy Superboy had them in some things like Coil. And they had a field telephone. They would have crank telephones. They bought a switchboard. They could put this in line and come along the line. Increase the useful length of the line. And as you might have posted, Wire in, the wire out, it's got a gasket snapshot. They were made over aluminum. Well, during the war, they want to save aluminum, so they put out a, uh, an invitation, a bit of contract request for somebody to build these out of something other than aluminum. And along with Lionel, who was making trains out of plastic and vapor light, did a lot of electrical stuff because they have electric trains, and they've been on this kind of contract. I know over the bottom. Um, now, I was studying something earlier today. Who knows what the Taft rate of log is on the ship? Oh, I'm sorry. The, what the Taft rate, well, actually, let me try. You know what the Taft rail is on a ship, a live ship? Anybody? The Taft rail on a ship is a live ship. Ocean line or whatever is the rail around the stern. Um, you can see six feet when you go leave over. But it was just the rail on the rear of the ship. So, how do you measure the speed that the ship is going? You need to know that to navigate. Um, so, it's a thing called the Taft rail log. On the ship, the log is a way of measuring. Distance travel. You use a stopwatch, you get distance travel time, and you can calculate where you are using that. So the Navy would have Taft Rail logs. And the Taft Rail log bounces on the Taft Rail, as a socket goes in, and it's 400 feet of 5 sixteenths inch cotton line from there out to a thing that's like. That propeller is dragged behind the ship well over the wake, and as it drags, it twists this, rotates it, and this records the distance that the ship is traveling. So that's a Taft rail ball. Could have been made by Lionel. I can relate this to a Lionel train. And I found this in an antique shop where it's somebody did it for the people. Uh, so Lionel made off all this stuff. And in December 1945, they offered the first trains in four years. It was available 
the light off train. I need to go off of there. So that's a light off train. It's all punched. But you can do it. Downstairs, we work most of us in Kyogre, the smallest one. Now, Montreal, the main impetus for building Montreal was to haul coal. So coal trains ran through here all the time. Uh, holiday, things like that. Up to quite recently, lots of coal trains. And in the uh, days of steam engines, by the way, the Pittsfield bought their first diesels, this kind of gear, that kind of 1948. The trains were all by steam engines. And from Berlin to Alabas is an upgrade, it's uphill. So there would be another engine pushing from the rear. And even recently you've seen that there was a, a diesel engine on the rear. Uh, so that was called the pusher. That pushed the train all the way to, to Alpha Pass. And then the pusher cut off, um, put the goons back on the train. The train continued on downgrade through the loops, and the pusher turned around on a wide track at Alphabet's and went back to Irwin. That's a sign. Um, we had some stories uh, on the Berry Gap wreck in the late 1930s. Uh, Berry Gap is on Alphabet's 32. Yeah. Uh, and the passenger train is headed south. The Berry Gap is just beyond uh, flotation plant on the Alpaz Road, everybody knows that is. And the pusher was supposed to know that passenger train was coming before he turned the Alpaz and headed back. And apparently he was unaware, of noise or something, but right at very gap, he was cut and raw, a little curve. And uh, I don't remember the number of people killed, but I know the engine two of them. It's a very serious wreck because some, somebody didn't follow the rules and the, the uh, timetable. Um, the Clinchfield, one of the things about moving things on the railroad is how heavy a train can be, how fast can you move. The faster you can move it, the more time there is for another train. So that's part of the economics. So the Clinchfield had these uh, steam engines. They were bought uh, second world war, uh, first world war, 19, 19, before 1920. Uh, and they were called articulated engines. There's actually two engines. On the one boiler. Uh, gets more wheels on the rail. The more wheels on the rail, the more weight on it, the more traction there is to that engine. So they would take these bigger engines, uh, and this time when all the engines are getting bigger and bigger. The Litchfield bought engines uh, just before the Second World War. Um, that are called challenges, and they run at quite a bit higher speed than these older engines. And during the war, the Clinchfield received some more of those. Um, I think the Clinchfield had the largest grouping of articulated engines. That was these one, two engines that were one more already railroad used to the road Mississippi. Um, so coal trains up <coughs> until I guess about 1952, could very well have this arrangement here. But more like 90 or 100 times, we don't look for So this, this represents a typical infield coal train. Um, now, there were other kinds of trains that ran on the infield. And uh, somewhere over here, uh, I have this uh, report from the Superintendent David 
1963, 67 rather, that lists all the businesses between Relief and Alabas that had their own private sidetrack or used a public sidetrack that the field service. And there's quite a few of them. Uh, and that says nothing about something called LCL, Western Combo Freight. Now, if you were a furniture manufacturer, such as Henderon uh, here, you might ask the railroad to park a box car on your siding so you could board with furniture consigned to a particular uh, destination. That's a car board. The coal is all the car boards. But if you're a merchant downtown, and you're going to get a bunch of small packages and things. That's called less than car load. Well, it might have shipped in a bus car to the local station. And the local station takes this and distributes to the recipients. Uh, I know I have some examples where the station agent can send a postcard to the conversion city of your shipment. Is that typical of what area? Yeah. So uh, that's called less than common And you know, you can imagine in the 1920s and 1930s, most of the workers here, that's how they got their, their shipments. Whether it was you know, Green Mountain or Relief or Spruce Pond and so on. Um, if you went down to a local merchant, you wanted the sewing machine, chances are it came as less than common in a in the box truck. So the Clinchfield had freight trains uh, that made local deliveries. It was one that ran from Mary and this was by they called them shifters. Uh, other railroads had other names for them. But they would bring the cars to the local station. They would spot empty cars at a business location that had their own sidetrack. Um, and uh, so a lot of stuff came in that. Uh, you can look at the Black Mountain Railroad and see that in Burnsville, the NC Board of Education received the poll. Um, and there's two or three other versions, you can see what they received. Uh, Heritage Lumber would receive a car load of lumber. Uh, if somebody had a job in the store, would receive a lot of LCL and so on. So there were freight trains that just carried all kinds of stuff. Uh, one of the things that I have is a tank truck. Gasoline. It was a, uh, if you have an old gas road, uh, before you get to 19 from here, there was a, a track that came across the Gulf some kind of reason. And that was called Gulf because it was a Gulf airship. Just beyond the Gulf Oil. Uh, there was an SO one that you could have referred to. Um, so a lot of that stuff. And by train before the interstates and the highways took that business away from the railroads. Now we have the passenger train. Um, in the 40s and 50s, there was, well, we started with one train each way a day, and they would meet somewhere not too far from the bottom. Um, one fellow told me a story that. His mother used to uh, give him whatever money he needed to put him on the train at Rose's Branch and send him like, to Tokane, I think it was Tokane, to pick up groceries and he'd catch the other train on the back. He was five years old. <laughs> so, Hutchfield had a couple of little passenger cars. We don't know that they had an observation car, but that's what it was. So we, we had one on board. They did have a power car for a couple of years back in the 1920s, and I don't know what it was called. But they had the RPO car, railway post office, and four of them, three or four of them. And the post office department contracted with railroads uh, up until the early 50s to carry mail. So not only were they carrying mail, 
there were post office clerks riding in that train who saw the mails that went along. And if they stopped at the station like Spruce Pine, they pick up a couple of bags of mail, drop off a couple, and so on. Uh, if they were passing a station like Wings, it was an arm on the side of that car that would swing out. The station master would take the mail bag and put it on a oh, mail room and the thing. The arm would come by and grab the mail bag and try to the car. Or to open it up and start the mail. And they got to wherever it was. Uh, the mail was pre slotted ready to go. And again, the trucking industry took that away from the railroad stuff. You can find mail at what was postcards sometimes. Typical postcards, people send a lot of postcards when they're on vacation or something like that. Or I've seen postcards dressed to so and so near on Bay, I'll be by next week, they'll both stay here for a couple of months. This is all for mobile devices. But you can find postcards and letters with a RPO postmark on it. And it will have a little circle and the date. It's a RPO and it has the number of the train that was crossed. Those are pretty interesting questions. Um, now another well-known train in the country had is called the Parachutes. And so this was a direct connection between the southeast and the upper and west. And in Florida, they take them quite a bit of clippers and other things. There's a big demand for that on top. So the windshield ran a train that was refrigerated cars. And these are cars that had bunkers using the end of the patches, big patches, for real. And they were ice. Ice was put in there in Miami. And we have a follow who did that. Very how big were those ice cubes? 25 pounds most of the time after you cut up the 300 pound block. Yeah. We couldn't get the 300 pound block down in it. Then we took and we went to blow that in too. So you know, there's several ways it was done. So anyway, these were refrigerated cars and uh, would transport the uh, produce and the crews. But it was still critical to do it fast. So that train had priority. And there was an icing station at the Oregon where they would replenish the ice. Um, and on the podium here is a flyer from the country a flyer that they used to promote that service. That train on the return would bring a lot of dairy products and process and things back. That was called the, the parachute train. Um, and this is an example of the first uses that the uh, I think that was the first application of them. Um, they made a lot of promotion about having those uh, diesels for this priority fast train. Um, so eventually we got to the point where the family lines came into the picture. And family lines came up with a oh, oh, let, let me back up slightly. So this was the original Palestine Litchfield head. And they had it on these original locomotives, they had it on a couple of successive generations of locomotives. The gray and yellow. No problem with people think. And they had it like a big battle washer they called the train show. And you look at pictures and you'll see some of these books here. They were really rugged. Oh, they had a solution. They painted them black. So uh, in the later days of the Fields are also there in the all that you've got painted black. So then when family lines came along, they had the scheme as I think a banner, they, they referred to this marketing record as a banner. And so this is kind of the family lines paint scheme. And then we saw a few others as you would find uh, Chesapeake on the highway you can spot downtown, you can find all these different railroads that Together. And then they broke up Conrail, the big railroad up in uh, the upper northeast, and a lot of the Conrail equipment ended up 
on the CSX, so they blew it and stuff like that. But eventually, when we got to the CSX, this is one of the schemes they had quite a while in. They brought more of the salt and blew them But the whole progression of paint schemes and things like that. And then what was the budget? That was called Cummins. And that was the second diesel that the Yancey Railroad had. Now it needs back to the The Black Mountain Railroad I mentioned went from Kona to Burnsville and service Yancey County. Um, it was a money losing thing for Clinchfield, so Clinchfield petitioned to abandon it. And the uh, folks in Yancey County uh, didn't want to lose that, and they put together. Um, with some help from uh, some of the uh, politicians, the state legislative politicians, uh, a plan to have their own railroad. They call it the Yancey Railroad. And they bought all these lenders and uh, wasn't quite enough. So this was the second one they bought. And it had little sideboards. Like, you see that thing launches the huge thing going. Mm -hmm. They had another one, a little bit larger one after that, and then finally that one, the uh, one of the park in uh, Michaelville, so on, in Los Um Does anybody, anybody remember what was leather on the side of that one that was in Michaelville? NPRR 40. And a lot of people said, oh, that North Pacific Railroad, and it wasn't. Well, it never gets to Peoria. A little 12 mile long railroad in Rhode Island mm -hmm. that ran from the Haven Main Line out to this place called Never Gap to Peoria. had a pier the And mm -hmm. that's the one that ended up in Michael. And they never repainted it. So, so it's in the Peoria. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of covers. Um, we have a model of the Fine uh, Depot beside the Utrecht City. And this is a, a pretty stock model. You can go to the pawn shop and buy this kit. But it's very close to the standard windshield uh, design for layouts. So we, we have that as our polar depot. Um, some of the different windshield layouts were basically that same design that we made our and practically all gone. The reason they're gone, they were going to pay tax on them. And they didn't have passenger service, they didn't have enough use for it. It was the writing book. And I've got some photos of the day record. Screw spine depots survived for a long time because the spine depots, the way the department uses it, uh, the signal department uses it for the radio communications and stuff like that. And, uh, Hopefully, well, someday the railroad may see fit to give it to the town, but they haven't. 